feeling nervous. Ooh, blah, blah. <laughs> Why is this so hard? Okay, on this channel, I've been experimenting with pivoting into some different video formats and today I'm feeling a little bit nervous because I'm going into a totally different format than I've really ever done before. It may be a little bit of a bumpy ride, we'll see. Today we're gonna dive into the whole dark world of Sigmund Freud, yes, the father of psychoanalysis. And let me just give that disclaimer that everything I'm sharing is my opinion. Any actions about Sigmund Freud that we're talking about are all alleged because I was not personally there to witness these things happening, but I will cite my sources wherever I can. And down below, I will have citations to even more things. So we're going off of the information I'm able to find. I might be silencing out some of my words. That's just so that this video doesn't get demonetized because YouTube, Mm, lays it on thick. Now there's no doubt that Freud's theories have played a critical role in shaping the field of psychology. And I also feel that some of the harmful, inaccurate, and fraudulent behaviors that have been reported about Freud are not acknowledged enough, at least in my immediate circles. I just didn't really learn about all the bad stuff that's there to be learned about. So we're gonna talk about it a little bit more today. So I started preparing for this video and pulling at the thread of all the icky stuff there is to find about Freud. That thread just kept unraveling. There's more and more and more. I can't cover all of it and I'm not an expert either. So what I decided to do is just compile a couple of pieces of information that at least I wasn't taught about in grad school. So I thought I would share a couple of those data points with you and you can do the deep dive on your own time if you wish. I've linked to some additional resources below if that's something you're interested in. According to the National Library of Medicine, Sigismund Shlomo Freud was born on May 6, 1856 in Freiburg in what is now the Czech Republic. Freud came from a non-affluent Jewish family of wool merchants. And in his early years, his family moved to Vienna, where he lived for the majority of his life. I tried to look into the cultural context of Vienna at the time in the late 19th century. There's a whole lot of things to be found there, but it really kind of encapsulated this combination of like innovation, forward thinking, and kind of experimenting with new ideas, while also very much perpetuating some very more traditionalist ideas at the same time. And these two things kind of happening in parallel which actually feels really similar to how I perceive modern United States times. There's all this like progressive innovation and also this like clinging to traditionalist values and those things kind of being at odds. Up until recent decades, Freud's relationship with Martha Bernays has been painted as this like idyllic, romantic, like kind of fantasy of a relationship. During their four and a half year long engagement, for example, they wrote a profuse amount of love letters to each other while they were in a long distance relationship. And according to some accounts, those are still upheld as some of like the most romantic letters ever. But as it turns out, there's more nuance to the story than meets the eye. I genuinely feel that being a person of integrity at home very much translates over to how you do your work, especially as a therapist. So let's take a little bit of a deep dive into Freud's relationship with his wife. So Freud and Martha Bernays first met in 1882 when Freud was 26 and Martha was 21. And according to all accounts that I can find, it was love at first sight. However, Martha's widowed mother did not appreciate that Freud was on this kind of like financially strapped academic career trajectory at the time where he was doing a lot of scientific research. Quote, Martha's widowed mother was not keen for Martha to marry this penniless doctor in training and moved the Bernays family to Wandsbeck near Hamburg, Germany. Their courtship lasted for four and a half years until they were finally married in 1886. I don't know, maybe Freud convinced Martha's mom that he had enough money at that point, who knows? And they remained married until Freud died 53 years later. We're gonna touch on this more in just a little bit, but in recent decades, it's come out that Freud's family and heir have offered to the public a highly curated image of who Freud is, primarily by moderating how much content that he's created is actually released to the public. And one of the items that they curated is which love letters between Freud and Martha were released to the public. It turns out there's a whole bunch of letters that nobody ever saw until the 1980s. Literary Hub offers an excerpt from the book, Freud, The Making of an Illusion, quote, upon reading the letters, 
Even Freud's sympathetic biographer Ernest Jones remarked confidentially to a trusted ally, quote, Martha comes out of the letters excellently, but Freud was very neurotic. Okay, we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive in this quote because I really want to know why does this biographer have this not nice thing to say about Freud? What's it based on? I know I'm going to mispronounce this, but here we go. In the Brout brief or engagement letters that he shared with Martha, we see Freud was already experiencing a problem that he would one day ascribe to all men, an inability held over from early childhood to reconcile female sexuality with maternal purity and devotion. His bride was supposed to arrive intact, submissive, and truly ignorant, but also to reciprocate a lust that he hoped would outlast the honeymoon. Yet, she was also expected to coddle him as her indulged son. Ugh. That role in Freud's estimation was a woman's highest calling. As he would put it in 1933, quote, even a marriage is not made secure until the wife has succeeded in making her husband her child as well and in acting as a mother to him. Not that I can speak for all women, but I can speak as a woman. What? People have been saying crap like this for a very, very long time. It just boggles my mind that we still uphold and glorify Freud and his ideas and theories when even at his end of his life, 1933, he was in his old age by then, he's still upholding this incredibly misinformed and misogynistic perspective. Can you tell that I'm getting fired up? Yes, okay, let's keep going. When he wasn't complaining about his present ailments and future neglect, the unhappy fiance was instructing his beloved on how to become a properly deferential mate. Oh dear. He made it clear that she would have to change some of her ways, and the sooner the better. It was precisely Martha's most admirable qualities, in the opinion of this author, on self-conscious candor and spontaneity, a trusting nature, freedom from class prejudice, loyalty to her family and its values, that struck him as in need of revision. Just little, little quirks that need to be revised. <laughs> Thus he rebuked her for having pulled up a stocking in public. We can't have that. Forbade her to go ice skating if another man were along. Demanded that she sever relations with a good friend who had gotten pregnant before marriage. And vowed to crush every vestige of her orthodox faith and to turn her into a fellow infidel. This is the wording from this book. Okay, there's a word in this next sentence that I find just is triggering and probably shouldn't be used. <laughs> but I'm reading the quote. The area in which Martha most urgently needed re-education, don't like that word, Freud believed, was that of excessive regard for her own family. From now on, he admonished her in a falsely jovial decree, you are only a guest in your family, like a gem that I have pawned and that I am going to redeem as soon as I am rich. Wow. These are things that he's saying to them while they're in love and engaged and in their courtship. This is kind of the foundation of an abusive relationship right here. The idea that somebody needs to morph into who I need them to be, they need to kind of disidentify from their family, they get cut off from their friends, their activities, their interests, their personality traits, and that he's advocating for this on paper in a letter that he had time to think about and write down and send in the mail even after writing it down. Like, this is really bad, in my opinion. And at times he teased her patronizingly about her want of experience and her inability to collaborate in his work. After she had tried to help him with a translation project, he wrote, I am nothing short of delighted by my little woman's unskillfulness. It's like, He's trying to make her into a child, but then he's also saying that she needs to be a mom to him and him the child. It's this kind of like weird parentification of yourself and the other, like there's just contradictions and imbalance and unhealth. And this is in their, like, again, in these letters. They're not like, I don't know, Marco Poloing or Snapchatting or whatever <laughs> the kids are doing these days. There's a lot of opportunity to edit your thoughts and to think that this was still the right thing to say and, like, put in the post or however they delivered messages. He's pretty solid in his perspective and he thinks he's right. I know he's not the only one who held these beliefs. I know there are people today who hold these beliefs, but it just... Mm. 
that. We're going to move on from their relationship. Hopefully it just paints a picture that maybe it wasn't the image of romantic, healthy relationship that um, often gets perpetuated about Freud and Martha. In 1896, Freud presented a revolutionary theory at the time where he postulated that mental illness could be traced back to prior sexual abuse, and he termed this theory seduction theory. The name is very problematic. We're going to skip over that. But let's talk about seduction theory for a second. Now, he held on to this theory for a few years, but eventually he redacted the theory in 1905, saying that it was incorrect. And instead, he claimed that when his patients were recalling prior sexual abuse, they were actually recounting fantasies. <laughs> okay. Wow. Now, a lot of people have a lot of things to say about Freud's seduction theory and then his redaction of the theory, depending on the author. Some people paint it in the light of, you know, the seduction theory really was one of the first times that people believed women's stories because it was primarily his female clients recounting these experiences of past sexual abuse, often from a family member. And Freud in this theory is saying, I believe you and how important it is that that is something that happened and that Freud contributed. So from that viewpoint, the reason why Freud would have redacted that theory is because he was receiving a ton of criticism at the time. This was not a theory that landed nicely in the laps of his critics. And basically then he redacted the theory because he's like, okay, 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 like I want to be liked. <laughs> and then just instead said that people were kind of making it up or that it was a fantasy. In an article titled The Controversy Over Freud and the Seduction Theory written by Betty Stein in 1984, I'll explain later why some of these articles are from the 80s, quote, Dr. Sigmund Freud abandoned his first major theory to protect himself and a colleague from ridicule and anguished for years over the decision, according to newly discovered letters and long secret documents. So from this perspective, it's like Freud the whole time really stood by his seduction theory, but in public, he kind of walked it back in order to kind of keep his clout. Now, on the other hand, the other perspective of Freud's seduction theory is that he was claiming maybe that all mental illness is rooted in some sort of past sexual abuse, and therefore, whether there was presence of abuse in someone's history or not, if they were experiencing some sort of mental distress now, he would go digging for that past sexual abuse with them even if it wasn't there. And so then by redacting his seduction theory, he's acknowledging that yes, some mental health concerns might be rooted in some history of abuse, but not all mental health concerns, and that this is a much more accurate depiction of what's true. Now, regardless of which of these takes is the most accurate, it all sets the scene for the story of Emma Eckstein, which was kept a secret for 90 years. I mentioned earlier that after Freud's death, a number of Freud's writings were kept secret by Anna Freud and Freud's heirs. All of this was revealed in 1984 in an article published in The Atlantic. And as it turns out, Freud had a lot of stuff to hide. So let's shed light on just one of these secret stories that only came to light 89 years after it took place, the story of Emma Eckstein. According to these letters that were released in the 1980s, in 1895, 27-year-old Emma Eckstein came to see Freud for analysis, complaining of stomach issues and significant pain with menstruation. Freud, along with what would be Eckstein's future surgeon, Wilhelm Fleiss, quote, believed that Eckstein's suffering was related to her masturbation. Okay, which she discussed with Freud during their psychoanalytic sessions. It was a dubious logical path, but Freud and Fleiss's solution was almost comically unfounded, according to this author. Quote, girls who masturbate normally suffer from dysmenorrhea, or painful menstruation. Fleiss later wrote in reference to Eckstein's menstrual pains. Quote, in such cases, nasal treatment is only successful when they truly give up this aberration. Like, is this even real? The layers. I mean, obviously we have a lot more data about, you know, painful menstruation now compared to the 1890s. I get that piece. But how do we make the mental jumps from, I'm experiencing pain during my period. It must be because I'm masturbating. The only way to treat it is to stop masturbating and have surgery on my nose. Like, based on what data? And keep in mind that all of this was kept secret for 90 years. 
So someone somewhere thought this was something that needed to be hidden. Continuing on with this article, Freud believed that the sexual organs were connected to the nose and sexual issues, particularly masturbation, were principal causes of neurotic maladies and that they could sometimes be solved by nasal surgery. Okay, so somehow Freud came to this belief and maybe it has nothing to do with the fact that he's like really good friends with this nose surgeon. I don't know, it's just fishy. Allegedly, in my opinion, it's fishy. In one of these many letters that was kept secret until it came out in 1984, Freud revealed that he was out of his depths in a letter that he wrote to Fleiss, the surgeon, in 1885. Quote, now only one more week separates us from the operation, Emma Eckstein's operation. Quote, my lack of medical knowledge, once again, weighs heavily on me. So there was enough wherewithal to know that he didn't know what he was doing, but they still moved forward with the procedure. Now, fast forward, Emma Eckstein gets this procedure on her nose. I don't really know what they did to her nose, but she nearly died from a hemorrhage related to the procedure. Now, procedures can be risky in general, but it later came out that Weiss the surgeon inadvertently left a piece of gauze that was half a meter in length, that's like a foot and a half, inside her nose, and that this is why she kept bleeding. On top of all the layers of issues we've already named, the surgeon made a huge mistake. Eventually, they figured this out, they went in and removed the gauze, which left her face permanently disfigured. After all of this went down in a letter that Freud wrote to Fleiss, the surgeon, again, which was kept secret for 90 years, Freud says, quote, no one is blaming you, nor would I know why they should. Yet Emma Eckstein had almost died in what Freud called a scene of bleeding to death. This is after Freud knew about the gauze being left in her nose. Like, so, I mean, if this was such a great idea, why did this whole story, everything about Emma Eckstein, was completely scrubbed from history until these letters came out in 1984? Why did it need to be hidden for 90 years? I feel like I'm only just starting to scratch the surface with Freud, but I know as I'm recording this that at this point in the video, it's already been a really long video. So we'll just touch on a little bit more, even though there's so much more to touch on. In my graduate school experience, I remember learning about Anna O, oh, and she was painted to me in my personal grad school experience as a highlight of how helpful psychoanalysis is, Freud's theories of psychoanalysis. Anna O, oh, her real name was Bertha Pappenheim. She was seen by Josef Brewer for analysis, and Josef was connected with Freud. So Freud never treated Anna O, oh, let alone met her, but he was very fascinated by her case, and he was inspired to co-author this book with her direct treatment provider, Josef Brower, called Studies on Hysteria in 1895. This circles back to that seduction theory we talked about earlier, but led Freud to conclude that hysteria was rooted in childhood sexual abuse. So Anna O's treatment was upheld as kind of this example of how psychoanalysis can be super helpful. Here's the thing about this entire storyline that Freud and Brewer perpetuated about Anna O they made up the entire outcome of Anna O's treatment. Quote, while Brewer and Freud may have painted the picture that Brewer's treatment cured Anna O of her symptoms, records indicated that she became progressively worse and was eventually institutionalized. And wait for it, I love this quote from Carl Jung. So the famous first case he treated together with Brewer and which was vastly praised as an outstanding therapeutic success was nothing of the sort. So maybe that tells us a little bit about why Carl Jung and Freud did not stay friends. There are just so many other things that we could say about Freud and I just don't have time for, but it seemed worth mentioning the story of Anna O oh, that's like kind of this like cornerstone through line of like, here's why Freudian theory is upheld and it was completely made up, which just has kind of fraud vibes written all over it to me. <laughs> Now, all of this to say, I do believe that there are items that Freud's contributed to our field that, at least as far as we can tell, he was the one who contributed them. The idea that talk therapy has the potential to be helpful. The idea that we all have our unconscious mind, however wrong he might have 
gotten his information about that, as well as the concept that like we develop in our childhood and our childhood experiences affect us in the future as well. Those are all things that were very Freudian and still hold a lot of weight today. So I don't want to say that Freud never said anything that was correct or that we should throw away 100% of what he said, but I also personally have had an experience where I've been entrenched in a culture that upholds Freud as this wonderful example. And not only are a lot of his theories totally bogus, we didn't even talk about those in this video, we also have a lot of evidence that suggests that he really wasn't the person of integrity that at least I would hope for from a therapist. Now, I'm not at all saying that we need to kind of like erase Freud from the textbooks or, you know, I'm not bashing psychoanalysis as a theoretical approach, but I do think we really stand to have a lot more nuance in how we talk about Freud amongst other major figures in our history where we can name whatever their contributions are, but also acknowledge their harm and how those harmful ideas are very much still the harmful ideas we're trying to overcome today. It's not like that thing that happened a long time ago that doesn't happen anymore. It's just the same thing in new packaging. So let's call it out when it happens in history so we can see it a lot more clearly when it happens today. For example, as a woman who has myself experienced sexual abuse in my childhood to at least hear voices of people calling out when that's been suppressed before to say, well, that wasn't okay. Here's how we do this now. That would have helped me out at least a little bit, I like to think. And if it sounds like I'm projecting my own experiences onto the situation, I am. <laughs> this directly influences me and it's been over a hundred years and it directly influences all of us. So the way we talk about history really matters. Okay. And rant. Well, if you made it to this point in the video, first of all, gold star, I'm pretty sure it's been a really long one. And also let me know in the comments what you think of this style of video. I referenced a whole bunch of things in this video, articles and books, and I I've added those links below and then some. So if you wanna do a deep dive, go ahead and check out the description box for those. And before we close, I'd like to thank therapynotes.com for sponsoring this video. Therapy Notes helps with scheduling, notes, and billing, and all of your practice management needs, including a HIPAA secure telehealth platform included for free for all users. If you'd like to check out Therapy Notes to see if it can help your practice run more smoothly, you can get two months to try it for free just by clicking the link in the description below. Whew, I feel like I need a nap after that. And like, maybe like, an episode of The Office or like a palate cleanser, because that felt pretty heavy to me. I don't know about you, but until next time. From one therapist to another, I wish you well.